Young, uh, graduate scientist at Oxford Baker Institute. And uh, I'm speaking a little bit out of my head today, but essentially, what do we know about the linkages between ice loss in the Arctic Ocean and the worsening of the weather in the mid latitudes? So let's first start a little basic. second warmest uh, temperature occurs on temperature record. And uh, the past decade, the 2011 to 2020 decade, was the warmest decade on record. In the ocean, it's a similar story. It has been accelerating in the last 20 years at all depths. Which has already brought about this idea of a new normal, where if we compare the previous decade of the previous 81 to 20, 2010 normal average against the 91 to 2020 normal, we see a very strong warming, especially in the especially in the Scandinavian and Central European regions. Um, this new warmer baseline reflects observed changes in the climate. Alongside this global temperature change, what we can also see is that the Arctic is warming at three times as fast as the rest of the planet. Here you can see these climate stripes, and these are particularly for the Arctic, and you see how strong the temperature change is right at the end. So this concept is related to what we know as Arctic amplification. And what is Arctic amplification? Here's a little rough summary about it. There are various processes kind of leading into it. Overall, what's happening is that increase in temperature globally is even more pronounced in the Arctic. So, there are various factors leading into it. One of the main ones is due to the albedo feedback because the, the difference in the reflectance, so how white snow is versus how dark the ocean is, means that when you're losing snow and ice from the upper layer, you're absorbing more sunlight into the ocean surface. This, this leads to a lot of other things such as um, a warming in the upper oceanic layer which gets integrated below and also a more you know, a change in the temperature um, gradient between the Arctic and the middle latitudes. There are other factors associated with Arctic amplification that I'm not necessarily going to go but they also affect us such as more aerosols or new stability in the water column, potentially more water vapor and clouds in the upper layer that actually be increases the insulation effect from the top. So, all this kind of ties in with the fact that in the Arctic we're losing sea ice rapidly. In fact, if you see compared to uh, the 1980 versus now, we've already lost up to half of the ice extent in September. It's true across the season. In fact, in 2022, which is the view line, the winter highest ice extent was actually the lowest on record. For the September ice record, it was not the lowest. 2012 was the lowest sea ice extent in the Arctic, but we're right near the bottom. And this again goes back to show here we have uh, another figure illustrating Arctic amplification. You see that there has been a, the temperature anomaly is present throughout the globe now. But as we progress further in time, you see that the Arctic is warming specific, especially strong. Um, so yeah, we see this temperature change reflected in another figure here where we are seeing the temperature anomalies in the map and we see that the peak is located right above where we would expect the peak sea ice to be. And actually some of the temperatures are off the charts. Um, but then this brings us back to the original question. 
Is the loss of sea ice also making the mid latitude weather worse? Now, one potential linkage that has been proposed is that a warm Arctic means a uh, uh, weaker temperature gradient against the mid latitude, which leads to a weaker polar vortex. And this is uh, this is something that we know that a um, stable polar vortex means that the cold air is contained in the in the upper latitude, whereas a weak or wavy polar vortex means that warm air can move north while cold air can move southward. So this brings a instability in the mid latitudes, which leads to extreme weather events. Um, there's another illustration here of how a strong jet has a more stable jet stream, whereas a weaker jet is this wavy jet stream leads to a further uh, dispersal of the temperature gradient. So essentially the idea is a warm Arctic leads to a weaker jet stream which leads to more persistent weather patterns. And uh, this weaker jet stream event has been observed multiple times in the, in the Arctic. So, according to uh, Jennifer uh, Francis, her, so who is supposed to be the talk, her theory is it takes two to tango. What does it mean? It means that when we had, when we had in the good old days when the sea ice extent was stable, the the jet stream was stable between these middle and troughs going up and down across the middle latitudes. But as we had a decrease in CS extent as the CS as is moving northwards, we're getting a, we're getting more variability in the in the jet stream, where sometimes the ice loss has no effects, whereas sometimes the ice loss is actually causing a, a weakening pattern and moving the cold air down south. So actually heating is intensifying the ridge, making it more persistent in this location. Um, this has been shown by various studies already. Certain linkages between midnight and Arctic boreal winter is something that is being discussed. However, now this comes to the flip side. The, the germ is still out of this and the recent research is actually asking if this is a this is a stable effect. But this is this has more to do with natural variability in this context. So I found that this was the perfect answer to this. The chaotic nature of atmospheric circulation precludes easy answer. So this topic is a major science challenge that is still ongoing. However, this argument is only about the connection between the mid latitude weather and the Arctic sea ice. We're not putting a, uh, there's there's no doubt about an increase in extreme weather cases, and this is widely agreed upon. And this is a report from IPCC which shows you an increase in extreme weather events throughout the world. Um, and there are projections by the, this is from the Met Office UK which shows you what kind of extreme weather events we're expecting. We're expecting a wetter winter, drier summer, more drought events, but there is rainfall and when there is rainfall it is more intense. So to conclude, global mean sea surface temperature has already increased by about 1.2 degrees Celsius, but the change is up to three times stronger in the Arctic, especially especially related to Arctic acidification. The sea ice extent in the Arctic is also declining substantially, particularly in the summer, where it has already halved compared to 1980s. This reduced sea ice cover and the associated ocean heat flux may be causing a weak or wavy polar vortex, which is causing more extreme weather in the mid latitude. However, this is an area of ongoing research, so the jury is still out on this link. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to thank Jennifer and Ella for the additional slides. And uh, I want to end with this picture, which is, I think in Arabic it's called Nagu. It's a strong dust and a strong storm event that happened in Arizona two years ago. So thank you all. And with that, I'd like to pass the mic to Robbie. I'm Robbie Mullen. Uh, so we organised this talk as a, as a double act, a late test. I guess 
that sort of like the, uh, the other side of the argument about this specific topic about whether the sea ice and the decline of extreme weather are, are related. Um, because although we, there's like a very, very clear consensus that the Arctic is probably much faster than the globe, uh, there is a very live uh, real scientific debate about whether specifically sea ice loss of Arctic aggregation are increasing the instances of really cold uh, extreme weather now in more than the mid latitudes. So by the mid latitudes, we mean places like the UK and the uh, UK and the So this is what the IPCC has to say in its recent report. Um, they say that changes in the sea ice do have the potential to influence mid latitude weather, but there is low confidence in the detection of the sea fields in specific localities. So when we talk about the detection, we're talking about whether we actually see this in reality versus what's happening in other things which uh, don't necessarily increase in reality. And if you'll permit me, I'll just, uh, just talk about a couple of key science-based studies that, uh, that the category to, to the traditional argument that uh, a rapidly warming Arctic is weak in terms of gradient, making the downstream more than the Earth is uh, causing more frequent outbreaks in terms of uh, in terms of Showing the change in the, uh, in the gradient between the equator and the land. And it's just blue, okay? and that means it's decreasing, right? So, although the equator is much warmer than the poles, the poles are catching up, right? This is what we call the Arctic Aggregation. So, and on one axis you've got when you start your, uh, your study, and on the other is when you're getting closer. And it's just blue across the board, that's the key message I want to get across here. So, the Arctic is warming much faster than the other. On the bottom row of this, Admittedly, slightly confusing, but I think a super useful slide is uh, the actual weightiness of that jet stream. And you can see that it's a bit of a patchwork of red and blue. And, and the result of that is if you're looking at changes in jet stream weightiness, it really, really matters when you start your study or when you end your study. And this is how we ended up with this uh, what, what we call divergent consensus on this, on this topic of sea ice loss, weighted jet stream, jet stream weather outcomes. So you can see that. If you start your observation in 1990, and if you ended in 2005, you see a red patch, right? So you see just very clear in the observational record increased weightiness in the jet stream. So you would conclude that because the Arctic is warming faster and the jet stream is getting weightier in your observational study, that these two are these two are linked, and we can expect a future of weightier jet stream. But as the observational record is lengthened, and we just have longer and longer studies. This, this, uh, this relationship is So now imagine a study that starts in 1980 and ends in 2050 or even later. You suddenly find yourself in the top right hand corner of the board. So you find yourself uh, in October, November, and December, you find yourself here. And in January, February, and March, you find yourself here. And, and you'll notice that. In neither of these two plots of red plots, you'll see a strong, uh, a strong color. So in neither of these plots, uh, if you do the longest possible study of these, of these numbers, you find a clear link between uh, between Arctic aggregation and the uh, And this is this is from Russell Blackwell, who's a bit of a, bit of a powerhouse in this uh, in this domain of science. So if you are interested in following up, I'm just Google Russell Blackwell. I just wanted to touch on one other really interesting argument, and I'm, I'm, I'm more presenting these studies to you me than for you to uh, dig into the uh, dig into the titles too much. But the top is a is a study that came out in 2014 saying, uh, hey, we might actually see less temperature than the variability in the day to day because of Arctic aggregation rather than that. And, and though I said from day to day, I did say extreme events, uh, and I think this is a really nice. Example of how science works. This study came out in 2014, and then uh, just last year we managed to actually attribute an observational trend to the human influence of greenhouse gases and global warming. So 
to, to summarise the top study, uh, I want you to just imagine that you, you live in the UK, I live in the UK, so it's easiest for me. Um, we typically get cold days in the UK when wind and air comes down from the Arctic. Uh, sometimes we call it the beast from the east, because it's actually kind of comes from the northeast. Uh, and we get super cold days when we get air from the uh, and on other days we get really warm air when it comes up from the south, it comes up from the equator, the chocolate, the cheese. So we experience day to day temperatures. Um, and both the air in the south and the air in the north of the UK, they're both in the same. Okay, so, so the, the temperature in the UK is here. But what's interesting is that the air in the Arctic is moving much faster than the air in the equator. So the temperature of those cold days with the air coming from the north is actually getting warmer, much faster than the temperature of the warm days with the air coming from the south. So if you were an observer in the UK like me, you actually experience warmer cold days, much warmer than the fact, and only slightly warmer than the warm days. So the temperature variability that you experience because of our gasification is low. So you might expect a more consistent uh, a more consistent experience basically from day to day, week to week. And that's not to say anything about uh, extreme weather outbreaks, I don't know if we already talked about that, but just in terms of uh, what was described here as the uh, the temperature, uh, the sub-seasonal temperature variability uh, in, in somewhere like the UK uh, may, may actually be becoming more consistent. Uh, I think I have a lot of Oh yeah, I just, I just wanted to, to counter all this uh, by saying that returning to the topic of extreme weather and saying that these, these jet stream arguments, these arguments about whether I think I'm talking about the controls of the jet stream and the arguments are very separate from the very real extreme weather that we're seeing in the world of sea accidents around the world of the jet so it's really important to talk about the mid and not the people living in the mid but we do see polar uh, extreme weather so, uh, and, and it often happens in ways that you might not expect initially. So, here's a, here's a really interesting study uh, that looked at sea ice loss uh, and, and rain in the land. You might not expect sea ice loss to directly translate to the land. Um, but it turns out that the sea ice loss retreats, so we suddenly put the ocean and the wind ocean was previously capped by the sea ice in contact with the atmosphere and it warms the atmosphere but it also suddenly transfers loads of moisture to the atmosphere and if that moves over the land it can cause rain and it can through the air so uh, rain are really sensitive to this rain are really sensitive to unseasonable rain they're really sensitive to, to what we call rain and snow events but also rain and fruit and, and rain are kind of weird little guys they live the life of for a lot of them and they rely on digging through snow to be. So this is a good study that looks at an unseasonable way of snow and the other things that's just east of the Finland in Russia. And we have this unseasonable way of snow that just makes us get a And it throws a layer of, of, uh, of snow and it made the reindeer unable to break through that snow. It was a hard layer of snow and it just didn't break through it to get to that light. And it got so death. It was a uh, mass death. It was actually millions of reindeer. And this happened in two and this happened twice. Um, and this is exceptional. Because we have fossil records of rain, but we know uh, a rough history of rain. And, and this is uh, really a drastic, a drastic event uh, that's directly going to see us in this is extremely bad that it's happening right now in the United States. And it's worth saying, actually, that as well as rain, a lot of species rely on uh, special for snow to get to stuff. So, so a lot of uh, those of prey in the Arctic owls hunt by diving through the snow and getting into like birds and snow. So as we as we bring about the sort of seasonal rain and snow events, we, uh, we bring about uh, the inability of lots of animals to hunt. Uh, there's also a really nice uh, study here that looks to find uh, in the barren sea. Always the uh, really unseasonable and extreme snowfall around Finland. Uh, and, and that is a, a nice example that's not linked to this wavy jet stream hypothesis, but it's linked to what I said earlier about a rapid, intense, uh, hazy weather process of visibility. Uh, a rapid transport of the moisture from the sea to the atmosphere that just dumped out of the really uh, extreme snowfall. Uh, 
not because of the wave jets being sort of blood and different issues, but just because the ocean was, was exposed by feeling back from the sea ice and the sea. And the underlying cause of that is, is much more to do with warming and just sort of and, and just, uh, just one more thought that I, I'd like to bring up about it. all these themes about Arctic and is that they really affect uh, glaciers and, and uh, terrestrial ice and And in some ways, that's, I hate to say it as a sea ice like, but that's the real threat because that's where we can all get things like sea ice. So, uh, we, we talk about uh, these things like the flux of heat and moisture to the atmosphere, and it's causing extreme, uh, extreme precipitation uh, over the great In places like Svalbard, uh, how these glaciers that respond at a long time together, and we have the capability to really wound them. So, sea ice, uh, sea ice decline and precipitation ties together in one of these slow responding. Uh, very beautiful uh, ice beams that, that could be really dangerous looking out to, to 20 So that's, that's all I've got to say about something. But if you have any questions about uh, about these themes, particularly about the jet stream, then try not to be very much a CI scientist, not a, not a meteorologist, but please be soon. Yeah, 
You didn't mention that at all in your, in your talk. So, yeah. uh, is there a reason why, or it, that's a different talk, I guess? Well, it's a totally different tool. So a lot of people talk about these uh, these jet stream breakouts, and they talk about like, snow and Siberian plane, particularly, and then uh, this thing called the Euro Philippines, which is where uh, a loop of the jet stream comes down over Eurasia and kind of gets stuck in the in development system like that. And whether that is changing, it's like a change that's happening to the rest of the sphere of seeds. Uh, and that's always really important for the project stuff. So it also has the timing of which the seeds are going to be out, whether that makes it better, so it's going to be better seeds. So you're going to bring it up, and it's absolutely a really important uh, feature of the climate system. Um, again, I think it's just a sort of a really intense debate on whether that uh, changes in that sort of area of the way that the snow field will be very important. Thank you.